I'm thrilled to be here. I've just been seeing so many longtime colleagues and friends, and it's really a pleasure. And of course, it's kind of a rare event that I actually get to be at the same meeting with my fabulous husband, Joe Margulick. <laughs> um, so I was asked to line up my comments around frailty and aging uh, in honor of the 10-year history of this meeting starting 10 years ago. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is um, mostly talk about that, but I'd like to give you a perspective from a geriatrician's point of view, uh, because I am um, foundationally a geriatrician, uh, is what, what the progression is that we have gone through. When I was trained in geriatrics in the 1980s, there was a publication by the National Institute on Aging that said that frailty and disability were the same thing. Um, and in fact, if you looked at the literature in the 1980s, frailty was not considered equivalent, interchangeable with very old age, multimorbidity, disability, particularly ADL dependency. Um, but, um, and, and it was getting the field into trouble. Uh, to have no specificity about what we're talking about beyond I know it when I see it as a clinician. We moved in the 1990s um, to uh, the challenge of trying to figure out whether in fact that was true that all those concepts were interchangeable. Um, or aging, multimorbidity, specific diseases and frailty the same um, conglomeration of stuff that were indistinguishable. And it was a challenge I particularly saw in caring for older patients that they had, they, frail patients, I knew it when I saw it because my frail patients looked different. They looked different. And that began my own personal journey, but many other people as well, trying to wrestle with what we were talking about. Um, and I think in the 2000s, we emerged into some shared discussions uh, about frailty being a distinct geriatric syndrome, not the same as multimorbidity and disability, um, and perhaps with a distinct pathophysiology. To mark your 10-year history, I'll create a somewhat arbitrary dividing point here and say that since 2009, although it somewhat matches our own research, we have really been trying to characterize what I have come to believe is a distinct medical syndrome like angina, um, and that this frailty syndrome is linked to a distinct underlying pathobiology that is aging-related but perhaps accelerated by disease. And increasingly, I believe, I'm trying to tell you the punchlines first. Um, I, increasingly, I believe, is the inverse of resilience. Accumulated damage along the way, uh, as clinicians, we know that that matters, that the more disease burden you have, the worse shape you're in, just to be a little glib about it. So it wouldn't come as a surprise to think that accumulated organ system damage might have some effects here. Uh, might. And now, since 2015, the National Institute on Aging has been leading, really, the development of the new geroscience, which has a, an organizing thesis that there are shared biologic pathways that emerge in, uh, that are aging-related, aging-associated, aging-driven, and that may emerge in the presentation of a syndrome of frailty, as well as emerging in terms of disease development. So this is the arc that I'd like to present you to, of, uh, uh, present you with right now of where we've ended up, at least as, as I see the field. I, I started thinking about this um, as a young geriatrician um, for reasons that um, were various. One is I didn't know what I was talking about when I knew it when I saw it. And it was very clear in the literature that what I knew, <laughs> what I thought I knew, didn't always match what everybody else thought they knew. Um, and we couldn't even actually characterize our patients unless we could develop some specificity. 
Um, and I did about 10 years of research uh, that you will never hear of, because nobody would ever publish the papers, trying to figure this out. And, um, and it was very clear that this, this is a simple list from a series of studies I did asking geriatricians, how do you, what are the markers that you recognize that makes you think someone's frail? What are the clinical stigmata? And there was this list, declines in lean body mass and strength, weight loss, loss of endurance, slowed walking performance, relative inactivity, maybe even homebound, and sometimes and often decreased balance and mobility. I spent eight years try doing studies trying to figure out why these things were in the same list. Um, and came to a conclusion, uh, painfully, I would say, um, that in fact, it was obvious that in fact, if you think about it, um, we know there are pairwise associations between everything on that list. So let me try and take you through that. And since my pointer doesn't work on both screens, I will um, try and talk you through this if you start on the right-hand side. So everyone agreed that sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass with aging, was somehow an anchor point in the development of frailty, whatever it was. And we knew at that point that sarcopenia, if you go straight down, predicts declines in strength and power. It predicts decreased exercise tolerance. And, um, and it also affects resting metabolic rate. And we knew that declines in strength and power and declines in exercise tolerance, because of science being done then, um, both predict declines in walking speed. And we knew that declines in walking speed actually predicted cutting back on physical activity. And we knew at that point, through really groundbreaking science that was coming out of Tufts, that there was a subset of older adults who had low physical activity on the left-hand side, and yet were taking, even at those low levels of physical activity, were somehow not regulating their dietary intake so that even when they're expending almost no energy, they were taking in even less dietarily. So they were not matching one to the other and, um, and were chronically undernourished. And we know that chronic undernutrition on the top of, the, of this figure worsens sarcopenia and when it gets really bad, you get into a negative um, energy balance and, um, and you, you start losing weight. So we knew about this pairwise relationships, and if you put it together, it becomes, at least to me, very clear that it, um, what I see here in terms of a cycle of frailty, which I proposed in the late 90s, um, actually matches the clinical presentation of vicious cycle that I saw in my patients. Now, I'll make four points about this cycle. Number one, as with many cycles, you can kick it off at any point in the cycle. And perhaps there are specific diseases which kick it off at different points in the cycle. Number two, the cycle, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts here. Um, any one of these may matter, but it's when the weight gets too great of the whole cycle that you start to get a sense that someone's frail. And number three, if you look at this, what you see going on when you link all these things together is the suggestion of a cycle of dysregulated energetics. Um, a, num a few years ago, later, after the development of, my development of this thesis, I had the opportunity to work with Russ Tracy, who's here, and a, and a group of fabulous colleagues Hi, Russ, in, in, in the cardiovascular health study. Um, and we took that thesis and we operationalized it in a major prospective observational cohort study of adults in four U.S. communities 65 and older. And um, I think what is critical to note here is that this is not an index. It was never intended to be an index, and it doesn't work as an index. This is a phenotype, much like you would look for the phenotype of angina, where uh, if you 
define a syndrome, it is, a, a, in the medical dictionary, it's a constellation of signs or symptoms that co-occur, and when a critical mass of them co-occurs, you have the ability to identify with specificity and underlying pathobiology. Ditto angina. Um, and so, somewhat arbitrarily, we said, well, if we follow the definition of a clinical syndrome, then you're looking for a, a critical mass of things being present. So we will say that people are frail when there are three or more of these criteria present that match that um, cycle of frailty, and that people who are not frail have none of them, and perhaps there's an intermediate category where people have one or two. We've gone on, of course, over the years to recognize that this phenotype is prevalent. These are um, very recent data from Karen Bandeen Roach and colleagues, 2015, from the national, uh, from the NHATS National Population Based Study of people 65 and older and, and community drilling. And what they reported is that 15% are frail and that the prevalence increases geometrically with age, which is one of the criteria you would look for. Um, to match geriatrician's assumptions about what frailty was. And notably, 45% match the criteria for being pre-frail. In CHS, what we initially pointed out, which went against the current dogma, was that the data indicated that not everybody who was frail had multiple chronic diseases, or even any chronic diseases, and not everybody who was frail was disabled. But there was significant overlap, uh, a basis for a lot of confusion, of course, um, suggesting that perhaps they were causally related in unspecified directions. We've gone on over the years with lots of colleagues um, to validate this frailty phenotype in community dwelling cohorts in the US, and many of the people here have have gone on to do that in cohorts and populations that they lead. Um, the data I'm going to report to you come from both the cardiovascular health study and the two women's health and aging studies. Um, and um, I'll explain that in a second. So the first question was how to validate this concept that this phenotype identified a, sub, a distinct subset of older adults who were as geriatricians had always said, at distinctly high risk and vulnerable to adverse outcomes. And one most simple way to do that is to say, are they at risk of dying sooner? Um, that's sort of the beginning, not the end of the story, but uh, and lo and behold, what you see here from our, um, our original paper was that the people who, met, who were identified as frail matching the phenotypic criteria um, only 81% of them in CHS were alive three years later, um, compared to 97% of them of people who had none of those criteria and 93% who had only one or two. These were unadjusted data. When we adjusted for um, 78 different characteristics, which I'll show you in a second, including um, a whole long list of validated chronic diseases, um, those who had three or more criteria and matched our definition of being frail were at very high risk of a whole set of uh, adverse clinical outcomes independent of the individual or combined diseases that they had. Um, and the outcomes include mortality. It included disability, so that frailty was predicting disability, it included high risk for falls, for ending up in the hospital, for um, poor post-surgical outcomes, for, for burn recovery, and for generally risk for slow recovery from illness. Um, the, those analyses were done building on prior work that I had led in CHS, and when, in which we demonstrated that if what you're thinking about is an index that predicts mortality risk, then out of 78, demographic, lifestyle, clinical disease, physical function, non-invasive measures, biomarkers, and cognitive function measures that we assessed, 
that you could pick out 20 that independently were predictive of mortality, and they're listed here. And they come from a huge range of characteristics. Um, having an index like this doesn't give you a way to intervene clinically, but it gives you a sense of aggregate um, adverse burden of behaviors and, um, and illness. The frailty prediction is independent of all of these and over and above their weight in terms of predicting mortality and other adverse outcomes. We also did a lot of work showing, uh, with, led by Karen Bandine Roach at Johns Hopkins, that the frailty phenotype is, in fact, as hypothesized, consistent with a clinical syndrome. Um, the definition of a clinical syndrome essentially is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, so having a constellation of presentations that come together defines an underlying pathobiology um, in very specific ways. And Karen led meticulous work to, uh, to demonstrate analytically that, in fact, the syndrome matches the dictionary definition. Very importantly, though, this only matters if it's significant to people's well-being. It only matters if it predicts as anticipated bad outcomes, and it only matters if it can help us find new preventive and therapeutic approaches to decrease the risk associated with becoming frail. So up until 10 years ago, I can summarize where we were, which is that we um, had validated a clinically observable presentation, which was not the same as multimorbidity or disability or extreme old age. That, as expected, it increases with age. It was more prevalent in women than men, in blacks and whites, and it behaved as a clinical syndrome. And it predicted disability and mortality independently of diseases. Um, and we started to get some insights that, in fact, there were underlying pathophysiologic processes that were associated with this clinical presentation, specifically that inflammation, chronic low-grade inflammation and inflammatory diseases were associated with the development of this clinical presentation of frailty. And further, that there, it was a chronic progressive process that those who were pre-frail were at very high risk of becoming frail and those who were, who were very frail were likely to die in the next six months. So people who had five criteria for frailty. So the last 10 years with that background has been about what I would call um, probing the bottom of the iceberg. What is going on underneath the clinical presentation that explains the development of the clinical presentation and who these patients are clinically? And I've come to think about this syndrome in the following way, that at the top, in the top oval is the five criteria in the clinical presentation, which, as I said to you, are linked in a progression from one to the other. Um, that those people who have that presentation have a lot, must have a lot of physiological vulnerability because they're at very high risk for bad clinical outcomes. And that, underlying that underlying that physiologic vulnerability must be some uh, processes going on physiologically and biologically um, linked to that if, in fact, this is truly a syn medical syndrome. Um, so I'd like to just, um, the second half of this talk, take you through how we got to where we are now. Um, I think the first insight we had from the work in the cardiovascular health study led by Jeremy Walston, which Russ and I um, were um, co-conspirators on, <laughs> um, showed actually that C-reactive protein was associated with frailty in a dose response association going from left to right, from not frail to intermediate to frail. We've gone on to show over the years that inflammatory diseases also are predictive of becoming frail and that the more inflammatory diseases one has, the higher the rate of frailty. We've learned many other things physiologically. Here you see work led by Ravi Varadhan in our group who showed that um, in the Women's Health and Aging Study, two women who at that time were 80 to 90 years of age if you, we looked at mean diurnal salivary cortisol and profile starting uh, first thing in the morning and, and uh, taken at seven time points over 24 hours, 
And what you see is that the, the salivary cortisol levels on awakening do not differ between the frail women who are in the solid line and the non-frail women who are in the dashed line. But what you do see is that during the course of the day, the frail women are awash in more cortisol than are the non-frail women. Over the years, we have learned that the presentation of the phenotype of frailty is, in fact, associated with biomarkers of a number of dysregulated physiologic systems, which offer a window into the potential patho pathological pathways going on. Sarcopenia, for sure. As I said, chronic low-grade inflammation and immune activation, low platelets, anemia. Um, autonomic service, auto, autonomic uh, nervous system dysregulation, for example, as measured by decreased heart rate variability, endocrine dysregulation by a whole variety of markers, particularly in carbohydrate metabolism, energy metabolism, adrenocorticoids, and sex hormones. What's going on here? Why are so many things functioning at abnormal levels in association with the phenotype of frailty? Well, they certainly, it certainly creates a picture of multi-system dysregulation. It's interesting that all of these markers actually mutually regulate each other. Um, they're not independent. Many are also disease-specific. Some may be specifically aging-related, like insulin resistance and shared and inflammation. But could this tip off some vision about what actually is driving the dysregulation of so many systems simultaneously? And are there shared pathways here between the development of disease and the development of frailty um, that this could illuminate? Well, the next step we took was to try and understood what it, what it might mean to have different systems dysregulated. Um, why was it that people are at risk of poor clinical outcomes when they're dysregulated? How do we understand that? And to do that, we conducted a series of um, challenge experiments with women 84 to 93 years of age who were in the Women's Health and Aging Study 2. Here you see the result of one of them, a glucose tolerance test administered after an overnight fast in these women, and on the left you see uh, 180 minutes of follow-up from the glucose tolerance test in terms of mean glucose level, and on the right, the mean insulin level. And the take-home point here is that the frail women in red, at baseline, their fasting blood sugar looks the same as the fasting blood sugar of the non-frail women in black and the pre-frail women in green. But after about 60 minutes, they diverge in their response to the glucose tolerance challenge, um, such that the frail women's response completely overshoots um, in terms of glucose and insulin and has a much prolonged recovery, suggesting that their regulation, dynamical regulation of response to challenges is very different than the non-frail and the pre-frail women. One of the other challenge stress uh, tests that we did was to um, have these same women do 30-second isometric calf exercise inside a magnetic resonance spectros spectroscopy imager. And we looked at phosphocreatine recovery in response to that 30-second exercise and over the course of the exercise. Um, phosphocreatine recovery, of course, um, tells you about whether they're repleting the ATP in the cell um, after it's expended in the exercise and how fast they're doing it and how fully. And what we found is that frail women had 43% slower phosphocreatin recovery and pre-frail women 15% slower than the non-frail women, suggesting that there's dysregulated energy production in these older women who are frail and that it might well be a factor that's contributing to the dysregulation of so many different physiologic systems. Story to be continued. Now, could that, for example, explain why we saw, looking at four hormones which are here, um, that 
every single one of them was at worse um, levels uh, if they were frail in the red compared to pre-frail in the yellow and non-frail in the green. Could there be some shared biologic driver that's affecting all of these in parallel simultaneously? Or are they affecting each other? Here you see, actually, um, the results of the two challenge tests I show you lined up side by side. On the left, the magnetic resonance um, measurement of phosphocreatine recovery, and on the left, the area on the, under the curve of the glucose response to the glucose tolerance test in these same 84 to 93-year-old women. And you see a very parallel pattern that the frail women on the right-hand boxes are much more dysregulated in response to these, this, each of the stressors than are the non-frail or pre-frail women. And we saw that across many, many other challenge tests that we did as well. So what are the implications? Well, the implications are, first of all, that energy is a big deal here. Uh, energy homeostasis, energy production, energy dysregulation. And we saw that in the MR spec studies with energy repletion being slower, suggesting perhaps decreased mitochondrial function. We saw that in terms of the glucose and insulin responses and a suggestion of insulin resistance and perhaps energy inefficiency or impair, uh, energy use impairment. And we found many other things about um, energy metabolism, such as um, less appetite stimulation in these same women and a pattern of leptin resistance. I don't have time to go into it. But, but many different dimensions of how the body regulates energy seem to be functioning abnormally here. And interestingly, these post-challenge findings consistently differentiate the frail from the non-frail and pre-frail better than studying them at rest in a stable state. It's under stress that you see the difference because of a different stress response, which is completely consistent with what geriatricians think clinically, that people may not even look frail but when they get hit by a car, when they have the flu, their response is really different than when people are not frail. Um, and, and finally, the, the aligned findings across many different stress challenge experiments that we did suggest that we're seeing similar dysregulation in a dynamic state across many systems, not just uh, a hormone at a lower level. So what are the implications of these multiple dysregulated systems associated with the phenotype of frailty? Well, I'll start by uh, a paper from 2008, which um, reported that what we saw was, um, here, this is from the Women's Health and Aging Studies 1 and 2 combined, uh, women 70 to 79. And if you just look at the yellow and red bars, what you see is that going from the left the people who were, the women who were non-frail, to the middle, the people who were pre-frail, to the right, the women who were frail, you see that um, there is an increase in the number of systems dysregulated in association with frailty. So the yellow is four systems dysregulated out of eight, the red is five or more out of eight, and you see that if you're frail, you're most likely to have many systems not functioning right. You can look at that here uh, quantitatively in a different way in terms of the odds ratio, and what you can see is quite a dramatic progression in the risk of frailty in association with the number of physiologic deficits that people had. Um, going from an odds ratio of 4.8 for those with one or two out of eight systems abnormal to an odds ratio of 11 if they had three or four systems abnormal to an odds ratio of 20. 26 if they had five or more. But let me show you these same data a different way. This looks a lot simpler, but it's really complex. <laughs> so here's the same data looking at the number of deficits out of eight systems at abnormal levels in association with the pre prevalence of frailty in the Women's Health and Aging Studies 1 and 2. And the important point to make here is not only does the likelihood of frailty increase going from left to right, 
but the relationship is nonlinear. The nonlinearity of this is particularly important. It speaks to the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, and it is the most critical indicator um, that we're talking about a problem that's about complex dynamical systems. What on earth are complex dynamical systems? Well, the, for example, the mutual regulatory systems that enable a human being to maintain homeostasis in the face of stressors. Nonlinearity is the foremost criterion for a complex dynamical system, but by definition, and I don't have time to go through all this, it involves the mutual regulation of component modular systems, which in fact is what I've been showing you about all these different systems that are dysregulated. They all regulate each other. And um, successful complex dynamical systems, which we live with, because they keep us from decompensating in the face of mild stressors, um, successful systems have huge redundancy and mutual regulation built into them. And, but, and everything looks great until the system's stressed. And when people are not functioning well, in this case because they're frail, that's when the abnormal function gets revealed, which is what I showed you before. This is the underpinning, we believe, of a robust and resilient, perhaps even healthy organism. And it's essential for our ability to maintain homeostasis, bounce back after stressors, and recover. And in this case, these findings link the physiology to the clinical presentation. What does that look like? Well, if you look at the top circle, which is all the physiologic systems that seem to be abnormal in frailty, um, they mutually regulate each other within the top circle, but they're also affected deeply by what's going on biologically. And if I, um, sorry, this got messed up. <laughs> Help. <laughs> I don't know what I just did. Can we go backwards about six slides? Yeah. Back two more. Two more. OK. So um, when, when you have this huge network system, um, and they are increasingly many systems working um, not elegantly, at a certain point, the whole critical mass of them being dysregulated passes a threshold, and what we see in our evidence is that that's when people emerge with this clinical presentation of looking frail. So there are a million things we don't know here. We don't yet know um, whether the frailty syndrome or its drivers are absolutely distinct from disease. There's lots of evidence that in some cases and particularly inflammatory diseases may kick off frailty as a final common pathway. And there are lots of points of evidence that these are distinct processes. We are getting clues that this loss of uh, the fraying of the complex regulatory network that maintains homeostasis in a resilient organism means that frailty is actually along the and continuum from resilient, and perhaps as its inverse. And we are, we are driven by this new neuroscience frame to ask, are there shared etiologic factors between frailty and disease? Uh, is one a final common pathway or the other, and to, how do they interact? And certainly in thinking about HIV and frailty, there's lots of evidence along all of those questions. But, there are, I'm just going to end by saying, what are the implications for prevention and treatment? If we have at the root of the presentation of the phenotype of frailty in a clinical syndrome, we have evidence that we're talking about the dysregulation of the complex system that makes us resilient. How do you treat that? How do you intervene? Well, one critical thing is that there are so many things going on that perhaps it's very likely that any one treatment isn't going to turn the tide here. Unless we can find the treatments, sorry, my figure isn't showing up. We can, unless we can find the treatments that affect everything, 
through one thing. The most elegant example we have of exactly that is physical activity. Um, because in fact, physical activity tunes both every biomarker that is associated with frailty and it tunes the energetic system. And if you, I'm sorry, I keep losing my slides and I'm not sure why. Can you go back to the figure? Next one. One more. I somehow lost the picture that I, go back one more. Yeah. If you look at the syndrome of frailty and, and physical activity in the top left, um, the arrows indicate all of the, uh, some examples of the many things that physical activity tunes and upregulates from improving strength in the top to um, lowering uh, inflammation and, and in the middle and affecting glucose regulation, et cetera, to actually upregulating mitochondrial function in the bottom circle. What an efficient intervention. So any intervention we find for preventing or treating frailty is gonna have to be able to be that elegant and efficient. Um, and physical activity has the advantage if frailty turns out to be ultimately a syndrome of dysregulated energetics, then physical activity has the advantage of tuning our entire energetic system. So if we think about the prevention of frailty and progression, there's a huge amount of interest in whether exercise and physical activity actually does what theoretically we might expect. We have these elegant data on frailty itself from the LIFE pilot trial, which suggests that in fact, um, regular physical activity in a walking and balance and strength um, improving exercise trial does in fact here um, lower the prevalence of frailty phenotype and lower the mean number of criteria over a 12 month period. So the, the outcomes are optimistic, but ultimately successful prevention is going to need to think about the whole syndrome from the presentation to the underlying biology and physiology to find the most elegant solutions. Uh, and I'll end by saying that we believe that where we are is that frailty in 2019 is providing us with a window into the biology of vulnerability with an eye to what creates the reserves and resilience of, an, of a human being who can bounce back in the face of stressors. Thank you.